Let's start with a quick prayer. Okay. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for blessing us with this day, O oh Lord. Blessing us with this time and this opportunity for fellowship so that we can hear and receive your word. Yes. I pray that everyone here opens their heart and ears and mind so they can receive the message that I know you want to deliver to them today. Thank you for all that you have done. In Christ's name I pray, amen. 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 So uh, if Paulo was here, he would, he, would, he would already say this. He knows I like to start off with a story. So uh, not long ago, I'm uh, cleaning the garage. And uh, I've got the garage door open and I'm taking stuff in and bringing stuff out and I'm throwing things away and I'm trying to do the spring cleaning that's necessary in most garages across America. And right as I'm messing with the woodshed, I see something and it moves. So I move. I don't know what's in there. And as I move and step back, this rat jumps out of this pile of wood in this garbage can that we have. It jumped? High. <laughs> and so it lands on the ground and it sees me and I'm looking and it says, well, I'm going to go that way and it runs in our garage. Oh, no. So in this moment, I have to make a calculated decision. Okay. Come on. Come on. See, my wife wasn't home at this time, but I, but I do know, despite her not being home, I do know one thing. She hates rats. Yeah. And uh, so I do what most people would do in this moment. I, um, I log on to Amazon and I immediately order some same day rat traps. Come on. <laughs> and as soon as I hit place order, as soon as I hit it, my wife clairvoyantly calls. <laughs> She was like, what's up with these rat traps? Okay. Hey, man, yeah, come on. Okay, email. Immediately. Well, I knew one thing at this moment, too. I needed to stay calm because my wife wasn't going to. And I didn't want to sell our home. I also knew that I needed to catch these rats. Yes. But don't miss this. Because we all know that there are certain things that we just can't live with. Yeah. Hold on to that. Okay. 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 See, a few years ago, this movie came out called How to Train Your Dragon. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty cool premise. Yeah. It's about this Viking village, right? Yeah. And, and, and they were invaded by these fire-breathing dragons, right? And, and, and the kids in this village uh, developed ambitions. The ambitions of these kids were to grow up and be dragon slayers right but of course like every movie there has to be a plot twist and in this plot twist the village's chief his son actually captures the dragon and he tames it and he trains it see my kids love that movie I actually watched it with them and it's interesting how it's a fantasy right that has been re repeated time and time again books and movies, plays, how about our lives? See, we have this fascination that sometimes turns into infatuation with dragons. Slaying them sounds really cool, but for some reason, it sounds even cooler to tame it and train it. Stick with me, I'm going somewhere with this. See, there's this desire to turn a deadly creature into a domesticated pet. Now, unfortunately, we do the same thing with sin. And Satan. And it's no coincidence that sin is often represented in the Bible as a deadly predator. And Satan is also represented as a serpent or even a dragon throughout the pages of the Bible. Wow. An old Puritan writer named John uh, Owens said, be killing sin or sin be killing you. It's simple, direct, to the point. Yeah. So this is what we're going to talk about today. This is what we're going to explore. See, if you haven't spent time in Philippians, you should. I love that Yenny kicked it off there. Yeah. 
right? Yenny. Great job, Yenny. <laughs> because it's a place where if we really embraced it, it would change the way that we live. Yeah. Yeah. Right now. So keep that in mind as we read, and I can assure you that no matter where you are in your journey, you won't be able to deny what we discuss here today. And this reality is, if we have Jesus, we have everything we need at our disposal to defeat an enemy whenever we might face one. If we, uh, if you want to begin going to Philippians 2, verse 1, Make your way there, and I'm going to prime it up for you. All right? See, what makes this so powerful is Paul is writing these words. And he's not writing them from some five-star resort in Mexico. All-inclusive services with mojitos and cocktails. No, 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 no. He writes these words from prison. In Philippians 2, verses 1 through 5, He says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ. See, what Paul is doing here is he's trying to teach us how to slay a specific beast called selfishness. And the truth is, not everyone thinks selfishness is a dragon that needs to be slayed. Some people, some people think it's a dragon that simply needs to be contained. In 1960, a writer named Ian Rhine Rand wrote a book, The Virtues of Selfishness, a new concept of egoism. And in this book, she expressed the philosophy of rational selfishness as a concept far from being a sin, but instead as a good thing. She writes, rational selfishness is the principle that an action is rational if and only if it maximizes one's self-interest by rejecting sacrifice in all of its forms. Reject sacrifice in all of its forms. She sold a lot of books. See, this concept of self-sacrifice was something she not only considered bad, she considered it downright evil. And it's because of this that she had such a big issue with Jesus. She had a big problem with Jesus. These aren't my words, these are hers. See, the biggest problems with selfishness and all dragons that matter. If you feed that thing, it's gonna grow. Yeah. And when it grows big enough, which it will, eventually it's gonna look at you as a snack. Oh, wow. In World War I, the US Army recruited people with one simple pitch. I want you. In the 1980s, the slogan changed. Be all that you can be. In the early 2000s, the slogan changed again to an army of one. See, this not so subtle shift from the army needs you to you need the army correlates with the reality that we have reached historic lows in military recruitment in all the branches today. See, my point is we have snuggled up to this dragon of selfishness and we wonder why we smell smoke. Paul is giving us a simple yet 
very effective recipe for slaying a dragon by reminding us that we all have the resources that we need at our disposal because we have Jesus. We have his love. We have his spirit. We have his church. Which means we don't have to fight for recognition in the community. We don't have to shove our way to the front of the line because we have what we need in Jesus. See, there is this deep sense of security that comes from a relationship with him. And the opposite is true. Because on the flip side, insecurity thrives as an offspring of selfishness. See, I don't know uh, if, if, if you've had the opportunity to watch uh, this, one of the best running backs of all time. They call him the human highlight machine. The joystick, Barry Sanders. Man, if you turn on his highlight video, it is just magical what he's able to do. People were lucky to get a hand on him, let alone tackle him. He was great. He scored all the time, and it was always a highlight. And after every touchdown that he would score, he would simply hand the ball to the referee. No highlights, no, no, no jumping around, no bragging, no taunting, no dancing, none of that. And he did that because he took advice from a, another Hall of Famer who said, hey, Barry, you're good enough. When you get there, act as if you've been there before. So he did. See, when you know who you are and how much you're loved by Jesus, it frees you from the insecurity that manifests itself in so many forms today. He delivers you from feeling as if you need to be recognized, admired, and revered. And this is precisely what allows you to turn your attention somebody other than yourself and serving others that is exactly what slays the dragon of selfishness every single time now let me make a confession I think in the church world today we have fallen prey to some of the same things that the army has over time, I think we have become way too apologetic. And we have tried to play upon people's felt needs as opposed to people's actual needs. See, it is true that if you serve in the kids' ministry, that you'll find joy and satisfaction in doing so, yes. It is true that if you serve kids with special needs, that you will feel good about helping. Yes, it is true that if you mentor children or open up your home to kids in need, it will increase your faith. Yes, it is true that if you go on a mission trip, it will be fulfilling in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Yes, but let me tell you something that's also true. Kids ministry is really hard. Kids can be messy, disrespectful, rude, disobedient, and spoiled. Some have come from really broken circumstances. If you serve kids with special needs, you're going to be very uncomfortable sometimes. You're gonna find yourself physically, mentally, and emotionally exhausted at times. If you were mentoring in school, sometimes you'll, 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 you'll show up and the, and the child that you're mentoring won't. You're, you're, you're going to question whether you're making a difference at all. You'll feel unrecognized, unnoticed, and often unnecessary. If you mentor young students and open up your home, it will affect your pocketbook okay. and home repairs. If you go on a mission trip, 
you will run head first into discomfort at every single turn. You will likely lose some sleep. You'll probably experience some danger. And, and, and at some point, you'll come face to face with some spiritual warfare. All these things are true. But guess what? We still need to serve. We still need to serve. Yeah. See, growing up, I would hear this phrase, see a need, meet a need. Yeah. See a need, meet a need. Start making your way to James 2, come verse on. 15. Come on, James. See a need, meet a need. Amen. And often we hear this and we, we coin it as a cool phrase. You might see it on a bumper sticker. See a need, meet a need. From somebody who maybe doesn't even believe in Jesus, right? But we as Christians, we know it reminds us of James 2.15, where it says, suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. See, we are called to do more than to wish people well. We are called to help people to get well. Now, here's what's cool. Sometimes, sometimes, you're good at exactly what's needed of you. Yes. Right? And boy, is that great when things line up perfectly. But, but if we're being honest, what happens most of the time is uh, you're needed to do something that you're not good at. It quickly gets uncomfortable. Right? But listen, if somebody is starving, it's not an excuse to simply say, well, hey, I'm not a chef. See a need, meet a need. And don't miss this, especially when there is absolutely nothing in it for you. That's exactly where people get hung up. What's in it for me? See, I don't like that. I'm not good at that. I don't, I don't, well, I don't need that. These are common excuses. You hear it all the time. See, Paul is aggressively trying to defeat this. This what's in it for me mentality. That you and I so easily fall prey to. The phrases that he uses are incredibly specific. In Philippians 2, 3, and I'll just read this one. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourself. See, when, 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 when I think of selfish ambition, I think of two things. These are just things that came to me, but I feel like they fit. Number one is a mercenary. You might not be familiar with what a mercenary is, but we'll talk about it. And number two is a politician. And we're all plenty familiar with what politicians are. Someone who is self-serving. Someone who will canvass a neighborhood asking for your votes and instead giving you false promises. Right? We're very aware of how that dynamic works. But a mercenary, what is that? A mercenary is a soldier for hire. See, a mercenary's primary interest isn't the country, nor the cause. A mercenary's primary interest is just getting paid all they care about and with Paul he is challenging us not to be mercenary Christians buckle up because he was dealing with mercenary Christians in his day if we're being honest mercenary Christians they've scared a lot of people away from becoming Christians you talk to somebody that doesn't believe, man, and they can trace it back to a story yeah. from a mercenary Christian. Yeah. Let's take Philippians 1. Uh, let's make our way to Philippians 1, uh, 15. Come on. See, Paul knew this all too well. 
And he wanted to make sure that the Bible reassured people today. Don't let that mercenary Christian take you out. Don't be scared away. Come back. He wanted to address it directly. He says, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy, out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. See, breaking news, sin never changes. Yeah. <laughs> it's never changed. Yeah. It's been the same since the first century. Yeah. Some preach the gospel because of selfish ambition, the platform, the notoriety. They just want to be heard. Mm -hmm. wow. Shocking. Yeah. Vain conceit is another word that Paul uses along with selfish ambition. I'm sure you've uh, heard of the book called The Five Love Languages. Yeah popular book and it basically talks about how people give and receive love in very very specific ways um Courtney can rattle these off the top of her head one two three four five <laughs> right <laughs> but they're words of affirmation physical touch quality time gifts and acts of service and often couples will take these little quizzes to better understand how they like to give and receive love from their spouses but if we're being honest, it's kind of weird that men even need to take this test, right? Like, in the study, it's overwhelming the things that speak to men. According to the test results, man, two languages really stand out. One's very apparent. It's physical touch, right? But the second one is words of affirmation. Can I get an amen? Come on. Now, physical touch, it, 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 it pretty much is self-evident and understandable. But words of affirmation, this one probably needs a little bit more exploration. Right? As men, we probably don't like to admit it. But one of the things that we probably want to receive more is an attaboy. Yeah. Attaboy. <laughs> there we go. Come on, Come on. Come on. We really enjoy being told that we're doing a good job. Yeah. And we may not want to admit this, but um, we can find ourselves on a very slippery slope. Because one of the outcomes of the presence and curse of sin in this world, for men in particular, is we have this tendency to try to find our identity in the performance of things that we do. Yeah. And it further gets complicated because life is complex. See, we often don't give to others the thing that we ourselves are looking for. See, one of the things that I've noticed about myself, there have been seasons where I have been really bad at affirming people and reminding them and telling them how good of job they're doing, how good of job they've done. And one of the reasons why I've been so bad at doing this at times and looking back and reflecting is I realized that I didn't give that because I didn't feel like I received that when it was my time. And this, my friend, becomes a cycle. It's hard to get off this ride. Yeah. <laughs> you ever been on that merry-go-round? Oh, yeah. There's a certain speed that you reach and you realize, man, I can't get off without losing my life. <laughs> I'm going to have to find somebody to slow this down and I don't know this big kid pushing it. Often, this, this, this can become a very uh, uh, never-ending cycle. This cycle can and will infuse itself into your friendships, your relationships, 
your marriage. It's just subtle enough to where you can literally become desensitized to it. Yeah. Almost forgetting that it's there, only recognizing it when it happens to you. But being completely oblivious that you are a card carrying member yourself. See, Tim Keller wrote a really profound book called The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. And in it, he writes, wouldn't you want to be a person that does not need honor, nor is afraid of it? Someone who does not need or lust for recognition, nor on the other hand is frightened to death of it. Don't you want to be the kind of person that sees themselves in a mirror and doesn't admire themselves nor cringe either? Wouldn't it be like, uh, uh, wouldn't we like to not fantasize about hitting the imaginary self-esteem home runs over and over again, daydreaming about success that gives us the edge over others? Or perhaps do you, can, do, you, uh, do you tend to beat yourself up and be tormented by regrets, right? Wouldn't you like to be free of these things? regrets. Ian Keller was influenced by C.S. Lewis, who said, in all honesty, a truly humble person would not stand out to you and me as humble. Because humility isn't thinking less of myself. It is thinking of myself less. How subtle is that? It's small small enough to miss it today, yeah. recognize it tomorrow, and then miss it again the next day. Yeah. Right? But so often we associate compromise with weakness. Mm. See, there's a lot of freedom that comes with the realization that you don't have to fight for what you already have. Mm. So here's what I want you to hear. See, we have to be careful about these leadership books. Just type it into Amazon, you'll get a thousand hits. And often it will tell you in order to be an effective leader, you need to teach people and lead like this. They need to adapt to your style of leadership as opposed to you trying to adapt to them. Yeah, yeah that's it, James. It's not until you have some kids. <laughs> that you realize this style is foolish. Right. <laughs> I've got two of them. Yes. And despite having the same mother and father, they are completely different. They require different things. Yeah. They're different enough uh, to understand that this, this concept doesn't work in real life. Yeah. And you have to take this and you have to apply it to the workplace, to your friendships, to your siblings. As a parent, I've come to the full realization that you have to parent to the personality. Mm. Come on. What that means is instead of this one size fits all approach to parenting or belief that because you think a certain way that it should apply to all things, that instead we should focus on the specific needs of the child or the spouse, the relationship. Now there are other ways of leading parenting and coaching that you can pursue like you can demand that that those adapt to you you can demand that everybody move in your direction that they flip the page when you flip the page you can throw your weight around and you can bully people into submission and compliance but the question is if we are followers of jesus should we consider ourselves bosses power brokers Forces to be reckoned with? And does that sound anything like our Savior? In Philippians 2 5, it says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, selfless, by taking the very nature of a servant, 
being, man, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. See a need, meet a need. It's everywhere. That is what Jesus did for me. That is what Jesus did for you. That is what we get to do for each other. So the question is, what does the person next to you need? What does your spouse need? Your coworker, the random person that you need at the grocery store, what do they need? Start making your way to Matthew 20, 17. See, this is one of my many reasons that I am thankful for Jesus. I don't have to wonder how Jesus would lead. I don't have to wonder how Jesus would parent. I don't have to wonder how Jesus would coach because we know him. Yes. In Matthew 20, he's making his way to Jerusalem and he knows what is ahead. So he calls his best friends to tell them about it. He says, now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the 12 aside and said to them, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over the chief priest and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Now, there is nothing unclear about that. People don't realize this, but Jesus is written about and this is talked about and recorded more often than all things Julius Caesar, all things that happened in Rome, this, this, this was very clear. And as much as Jesus' disciples hoped that it wouldn't happen, nor wanted it to happen, Jesus was clear about it. And, and as tough as it was to imagine that Jesus would have to endure something like that, Jesus did not beat around the bush. But check this out, and I don't want you to miss this. Right on the heels of this being said, Jesus just said some of the most important words that he's ever said, right on the heels of that. Right on the heels of that being said, see what happens in the following verse, the mother's request. Then the mother of Zebedee, sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want? He asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Let that marinate for a second. He just talked about the biggest sacrifice ever. Yes. And she's like, hey, can you do me a favor? I need one favor. Twice. Because I'm going to say one son on one side. And then I'm actually going to ask you for another favor. I want my other son on the other side. I need more from you, right? Like, if you've ever uh, wondered if the dragon of selfishness has been around, it's right here. Yeah. Just look at the Bible and you will find it. Yeah. Followers of Jesus, they were always coming right next to it a lot of the time, yeah. right? Yeah. That's how powerful it is. Yeah. Literally, right after being told explicitly about Jesus' brutal, uh, uh, Burial and re resurrection. Two mama boys. They asked their mom to make a request. A ridiculous request. We know how Jesus handled it. Because if you read along, it says, You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup? Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those who, uh, for whom they have been prepared by my father. When the 10 heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you and said whoever wants to become great among you must be uh be, must be your servant and whoever wants to be first 
must be your slave. Just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And here's where the whole sermon leads up to, right? The son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life. See, nothing compares to true Christianity. Nothing slays the dragon of selfishness like the ability to put others before yourself. Ask yourself right now, do you do this? It can be uncomfortable. See, as it turns out, Jesus was right. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Now, this isn't a conventional wisdom of the world. It's crazy. 50% of marriages fail. 50%. What's even crazier is that once you learn everything from your first marriage, your second marriage has a lower success rate. 67% of second marriages fail. Often people want what they want. They're not in it to serve others. They're not in it to be selfless. No, they dig in. That beast has grown large. That dragon lives and thrives. But here's the amazing thing. Each week we get to gather here a space on Sundays to talk about the fact that Jesus didn't just speak those words, he lived them. He backed them up with the most ultimate sacrifice. And I'm closing out with Luke 638. That's what I'm talking about. (laughs) There's another cycle that you can get into. See, some call this karma. We like catchy phrases. But this this was written before Hinduism. This 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 is the real karma. Luke 638 says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It will be poured into your lap. For the measure, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So I just hope that everybody today has an open heart. We want to self-reflect. We want to be more selfless. Don't let this dragon grow in your life. And to God be all the glory. Thank you. Amen.